Excellent. Now we're recording. Sweet. So this is the, the Monday morning makeup session. Um, did you guys, do you have Bibles? Did you bring Bibles? All right. No, I'm going to have to open it in my browser or something. Okay. So. There's a link. If you go to Slack, I had posted a link last week for the Friday session where you okay. can click on the link. It'll take you to Bible.com. It's the same version I'll be reading out of, and it's already open to the passage we're going to be in. So you won't have to hunt around. And Vamsi, I did contact christianbook.com, and they were like, we don't know where it went. We shipped it, and it disappeared. So we're going to send you a new one. So they've, they've sent you a new one. If it does not show up, um, I might try Amazon next. I don't know. We'll figure something out to get yeah, you a Bible. No no um, but for now, you can follow along on the, the Bible.com. And I'm going to stick you all up here. That's better. So now it looks like I'm looking at you when I'm talking to you. There we go. That's perfect. It doesn't want to stay down here, though. Okay. I'll do like this. Sweet. So before we dive in, I'll pray, and then, um, then we'll get straight into it. Okay? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a sovereign God. There are no things that are outside of your control. You ordain all things. You don't move us around like puppets or marionettes. But Lord, you work actively in history to accomplish your purposes and your plan. And this meeting is one of those things. This is something that I could not arrange on my own. I can step out in faith and be, be willing to just be here and, and to open your word and to study it and to teach it. But Lord, you bring people and uh, you ordain that our schedule should align so that we can do this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, you would bless this time, that you would make this a time where we can grow closer to you as we learn more about each other and as we learn more about what your word says, about who Jesus is and who we are to be in him. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to understand things that are spiritual today, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate them for us so that they make sense. And so that they change our lives, that they change our, our families, they change our work and the people around us because of the outpouring of your spirit in us. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So let's see. I got to get my, my pen out here. I got this awesome drawing tablet for Christmas last year. And let's see if I can get it working. All right, so I teach, I've taught a lot of age groups. I've taught little kids and adults and even old adults. And I always start by saying, I'm Mr. Scott. And uh, yeah, little kids always laugh. And then we're gonna be in John chapter one. And I'd like for us, before we get into John chapter one, to talk a little bit about where John is in the Bible. Because the New Testament's a big place and we're just gonna be in one little sliver of it for this study. So if you've got um, a table of contents, Vamsi, if you're on that website, the table of contents is going to be harder to find, but you can probably find it if you just drop down and look at the list of books in that drop down and Lauren just flip to the beginning of your Bible. If we look at the New Testament, I'm going to go ahead and move you all back out of the way because I need more space up here. If we look at the New Testament as a whole, New Testament, It starts off with the Gospels, the four Gospels. And what are those Gospels? What are their names? You'll have to unmute because we, we're going to be talking in this class. <laughs> uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very good. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And three of these, one of these is the one we're going to be studying, this one right here. This is the Gospel of John. These three right here are often called the synoptic gospels. Synoptic sort of meaning they're kind of the same. Now, I've actually heard two definitions for synoptic. One is they're kind of the same. So you see this root word here, sin, sign, is sort of like the word synonym, where two words mean kind of the same thing. The three gospels uh, at the beginning of this group, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are written by three different men, but they're written to three different audiences. And so they've got a little bit of different writing style. They've got a little bit of a different approach, but they generally contain a lot of the same information, a lot of historical content, a lot of the teaching passages of Jesus, 
um, and a lot of the same parables. So they focus a lot on parables and, and teaching concepts. John, however, was written much later than the first three. Theirs were written early in the New Testament church time. John was written a little bit later. He had been an, a, a member of, of the, the ruling body of the New Testament church in Jerusalem, and he had sort of retired to Ephesus. And when he was there, um, God laid it on his heart to write another gospel. And John's gospel is often called a spiritual gospel. And, and, and as we get into it, you're going to see why. It's, it's not quite uh, just history. There's a lot of application. There's a lot of doctrine that's taught here that's, that's weighty. It's spiritual. And if you read all four, you'll get to John and go, this one's way different. Like, like way different. And so that's, that's where John is. So what comes after John in the New Testament? the acts acts so acts is the acts of the apostles so there's the 12 apostles that jesus commissioned he he chose 12 apostles to go out and help start the new the new testament church the book of acts is about what those apostles did after jesus died was buried raised on the third day and then later ascended unto heaven that ascension is covered in acts and then all of the you've got the first large portion of acts is about um, the apostle peter and his missionary journeys and and works and then it transitions into talking about Paul and his missionary journeys, which is a good segue into the next section after the four Gospels and the book of Acts, which cover a lot of history. We get into what are called epistles. And epistles are just a, a big word for really long letters. And the first section of those epistles are called Pauline epistles. Now, that's because the, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote them. And he wrote, actually, the majority of the New Testament, the largest chunk of it. So the first one of those is Romans, and the last one is uh, Philemon. And oh, he's got a really long name. And they're ordered in a particular way. They're not ordered by... Uh, chronology or theme or anything like that, they're ordered actually by size. So Romans is like his magnum opus. It's the longest of his epistles. Philemon is the shortest. It's just a couple pages. And so if anybody asks you, this is a little, little Bible trivia here, how are things ordered? We're, we've got the historic, we've got gospels, we've got a little bit of history with the book of Acts, and then we get into the epistles, and Paul's is the first, and they're just ordered by size. So after Paul's epistles, what comes next in your, in your table of contents? I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep a thumb in there on the table of contents. We're going to go through the whole New Testament here. That Hebrews. Hebrews. Yeah. Hebrews is perfect. So Hebrews... We don't know who wrote Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews does not include his name, and we don't have a good sense of historical other people outside of the Bible, extra biblical writings about who wrote the book of Hebrews. So if we're really accurate, we always refer to the author of Hebrews the long way. We have to say the author of Hebrews every single time. Okay, But we stick it right after Paul because we're kind of sure Paul probably wrote it. It sounds a lot like Paul's writings. It covers a lot of the same themes that Paul wrote about. And Paul had a great heart for his, um, his brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith. He came from a very Jewish background. He was a Pharisee um, and, and, a, and an expert in the law and even persecuted Christians before his conversion. And he writes at length, especially in the book of Romans, about his desire for Hebrews to be saved. So we stick the, the book of Hebrews right there. After Hebrews, um, Lauren, is, is that Peter next? No, oh, James. James, thank you. I always forget James. Mm -hmm. James is one of the half-brothers of Jesus. Same mother, different father, obviously. Um, and he, so he wrote the book of James, and then comes Peter, right? Okay, so these are called the Petrine Epistles. Peter wrote them. We've got one, two, Peter. 
after P, uh, the Petrine epistles, this is a really long word, the Johannine epistles. Now, that just means John wrote them. This is one, two, three, John. Jude is another half-brother of Jesus, and his is really short. It's one page. And then we've got the book of Revelation. Now, sometimes you'll see, especially in older writings, the book of Revelation called, whoops, that's behind my face. I'll write it up here. Yeah, you'll see it called the Apocalypse. Because at the beginning of the book of Revelation, it says this is the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Apocalypse is Greek that just means revelation. A lot of times in uh, modern media, you'll see movies, oh, it's the apocalypse, and we think it's, it's this big single event that's the end of the world. That's not actually what the word means. The word just means revelation, something that's been revealed. And so um, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end of days. So among all of these books in the New Testament, John wrote the Gospel of John, the John that we're talking about here. John wrote the Johannine epistles, which are letters that he wrote to churches that he helped start on his missionary journeys as he traveled around um, the, Old Test the, the New Testament world at the time. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. When he was on the Isle of Patmos being exiled there, um, Jesus Christ appeared to him. And so he wrote five books of the New Testament, which other than Paul, Paul uh, wrote more than anybody else in the New Testament, John wrote five, which makes him the second most prolific writer in the New Testament. And yet John, of all the apostles, all 12 apostles, died last and was the only one that wasn't martyred. He died of natural causes. He died of old age. And so it was almost like the, the Roman world at the time just totally overlooked him. They weren't worried about him. They didn't see a need uh, to worry about him as being a dangerous guy so that they would need to, to martyr him like they did some of the other ones. And yet his writings persist today as can, taking up a large portion of the New Testament. And they cover a lot of our understanding of the doctrine of who Jesus is and, and who we are to be in him. So let's see, I'm gonna do some erasing here and let's talk. Does any of this make sense? Does this make sense to you guys? Oh, that, that's the wrong color. Here we go. I like to get a sense of where we are in scripture before we dive in to where we're gonna be. I just erased John one. All right, five pixels. Put this back here. We're still in John one. So the John that we're talking about, the apostle John, is not, if you've read your New Testament, is not John the Baptist. These are two different guys. The John that wrote the Gospel of John is John the son of Zebedee. And he had a brother. We often see them um, listed together, James and John. And they were, as the sons of Zebedee, they were, they were nicknamed together the Sons of Thunder. And we'll see that nickname pop up um, as we study. This was a description of their character. These guys were action takers that didn't take any business from anybody. Okay, There was one time that Jesus was going to travel through Samaria into Jerusalem. He wasn't planning on stopping in Samaria and teaching and spending time with them. He was going to go all the way to Jerusalem. He just needed to stay in a town in Samaria for a little while. And that town, because he wasn't going to stay, said, um, well, if you're not going to stay long term, you need to just head on. Okay, don't stay here. And James and John got mad. And John said, well, should we just call down fire from heaven and destroy the town? Like, not, not like, let's just move on. No, no, if they don't want Jesus to be here for even one day, let's just level the place. Okay, that's the attitude of this guy. Now, this is the same guy who speaks at length in his epistles about the need for love. So there's a total transformation as he lives with Jesus for three years and then serves as one of his apostles. We see a big transformation in who, who he is and who his character is. But I wanted you guys to get that, a picture of kind of who he is there. John was one of the, what else do we know about John? We know he was one of the 12 apostles. And oftentimes we'll see this, we'll hear Jesus had 12 disciples. Disciples kind of just means followers. 
And Jesus had many followers, but only 12 of them were commissioned by him um, in an apostolic office. That means someone who was with Jesus and was specifically commissioned by him to teach doctrine and to help found the New Testament church. But there were many, many more disciples. And um, he was one of the 12 apostles. He was also one of the inner circle. Um, that's not an official term, but we see many situations in um, Jesus' ministry where he pulled aside James, John, and Peter to go do something special. And so John was one of this group of people who saw him at the transfiguration. This is where Jesus went up on the mountain and was transfigured before them into the glory that he had um, from the beginning. And they saw him in his, his state almost as a, as a deity. I mean, like it was still the same Jesus. They recognized him as Christ, but they could see the glory. Um, and they were in awe of that, like almost stuttering in awe of that. And John was privy to that moment. He was also there at the, um, the Last Supper where he leaned up against Jesus and had an intimate conversation with him about who was going to betray him. And Jesus revealed that to him when he didn't reveal it to the rest of the apostles. Now, one of the most important things, one of the things that I want us to, to really notice as we study the book of John is John never refers to himself in his gospel by his own name. He uses all the other disciples' names except for his own. And the only thing he calls himself, if I can get my marker to come back, is that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's how he refers to himself every single time. And it's almost as if, if somebody was to walk up to him and say, John, tell me about yourself. The thing he always went straight to was, the most important thing you need to know about me is Christ. The most important thing you need to know about who I am is who Christ is and my relationship with him, about what he's done for me. And it's like, it's like somebody's walking up to you, Lauren, and saying, well, who are you? And the first words out of your mouth is, you need to know about Jesus if you're going to know about me. Okay? And that's how John thought of himself. That's how he went about talking to people. And it's, filled, it's all the way through the Gospel of John. That's how we're going to see him describe himself. That was the most important thing to him. So, you'll get a picture of who John is. This is a, this is a, this is a quick overview here. Questions? You see some, some nods. All right. Let's read. The book of John is um, sort of divided up. You could divide it into two major sections. The first is the prologue, and it's pretty short. It's John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And this is where we're going to get some some real deep richness. And today we're not going to cover all 18 verses. We're only going to cover five verses because we're going to go slow and we're going to dig into what these, these things mean. Um, but I want us to read all 18 verses first, and then we'll get into the first five. So there's three of us. We've got 18 verses to cover. So how about we just read six of them each? So Lauren, if you'll read six, Bamsi, if you'll read the next six, and then I'll finish up and read um, the last six. Perfect. Okay. So, um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. All right, Bamsey, you take the next six, starting in verse seven. Okay. Um, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light 
which gives light to everyone was coming to the world he was in the world the world was made through him yet the world did not know him he came to his own and his own people did not receive him but to all who did receive him who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of god who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god Good. and uh oh. You, you went over six, but that's perfect. You're doing great. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll pick up at 14. And the Thanks. word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So, now, I should have prefaced uh, when we started reading. It, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New Testament, which, raise your hand if you know fluently Hebrew and Greek. I don't. So that means that if you ever hit any words here that you don't know, you just plow through it because none of the rest of us know how to read it either. You just, however it comes out of your mouth, that's the way to say it. So don't ever, don't ever hesitate. Okay. We didn't get into any, any too hard words here, but we're going to get into some names after we get after this, the, the prologue and the names are always written in the original language. Just, just butcher it however you like, because none of the rest of us know how to say it either. So we're going to start in verse one. And it says in verse one, I'll reread it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So this in the beginning phrase, what does that remind you of elsewhere in scripture? In Genesis. In Genesis. Genesis chapter one is the account of creation. And this is a direct parallel in language. John is doing this intentionally to call our mind back to Genesis, which means we need to go read Genesis. So let's flip back to Genesis. Um, Bomzi, if you're on the computer, you can, you can use the drop down and go back to Genesis or, or you can wait, it's up to you. Um, so I'll, I'll read this part. I'm gonna read the first three verses of Genesis chapter one. And I want you to listen for the parallels, listen for the parallels in language. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, we see in the beginning, God. And in John chapter one, we see in the beginning, and what word does it use? In the beginning was what? Oh, y'all are both muted. You should just totally unmute. Okay. Um, in the beginning was the word. Was the word. Okay. Now the Greek word here for word that's used is logos. Logos. And that, that looks like this in English. Okay. So this word logos in Greek is, has two parts. It's used both for the inner word, which we would call thought or reason. And it's also in Greek used for the spoken word. It's used for what's on the inside, and it's also used for the expression of what's on the inside. So I might have an inner word or a thought, but then I communicate it to you by speaking it. And the word logos is used for both. And that's appropriate here. First of all, Jesus, uh, Jesus is privy to the innermost thoughts of the Father and the Spirit. And so it makes sense that we would use this for the word thought, this, this inner word. But also Jesus is this expression. He's this spoken word of God. When we, when we looked back at Genesis chapter one, it says, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so Jesus is, is also sort of this expression of, of the inner, he's the outward expression, the, the outward presence 
of God's working hand in the world. And so that's, that's why the word logos here is appropriate. But one thing that's interesting, if we, if we look at this phrase, in the beginning, if we, I'm going to draw a timeline. That is a terrible timeline. Let's do this. That's better. So if we go eternity future to eternity past, like this, this is all of time. And at some point right here, I'm going to put a big C for creation. In the beginning was God. And then after creation was the world. This is a globe, by the way. And there's the sun and a moon and stars. And there's Milky Way galaxy. And everything that exists is after this point. And before this point, what was there? Uh, the Big Bang. <laughs> What does it say in Genesis before this point? It says there was nothing. The earth was without form and void. In other words, there was literally nothing but God. There was only God. But this says in the beginning was the word. So right out of the bat, we see a claim to Christ's deity that Jesus is God, that the Jesus that he's calling the word and using that as one of the names of Christ, that Jesus is God. Now, he doesn't want us to miss it, but before he starts to repeat on this concept, he uses another phrase. He says, in the beginning was the word, um, and the word was, I need to erase here. Let's do this. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? Made flesh. No, no, that's further on. I'm looking at the second clause of verse 1. After in the comma. In, oh, we're back in John, sorry. Back in John. Sorry. Yeah, John chapter 1. Oh, and the Word was with God? Good. And the Word was God. Good. The Word was with God. And so we see here, there, Jesus is God, but Jesus was also with God. So we see that they're separate. Now I'm going to draw a little picture here, and forgive me, because I'm a stick figure guy. All right, so here's, here's God the Father, and he's got a long beard and hair, and, and we're, he's looking all Father time-ish, okay? And here's God the Son. This is Christ. And he's going to look like a son, but he has more hair than me, okay? And they were with each other. Now, they're not with each other like you and I can be nearby each other, or like I'm here with my wife. She's here in the house. Because before creation, there was no space. There was no matter. There was no time for that matter. And so it's not like there are two persons that are standing next to each other. Because we also said that they're both God. Not God's plural, but a single God. The Bible is very um, adamant about the idea of monotheism. There is one God. But one of the things that it's also clear on is that God is three in persons. So these are separate persons. Wow, that's separate persons. And oftentimes, we'll refer to this as the Trinity. The Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we see them in order. Um, God the Father, eternally begotten, is the Son, and proceeding from both is the Spirit. That's going to go behind my face, but you can still kind of see it. And together, these make up the three persons of the Godhead, and yet they are one in essence. They are one in thought. They are one in um, divine nature. So they're one in that respect, but they are also three. And this is a little hard for us to wrap our minds around, but we can't get away from it in Scripture. It pops up over and over and over that this is the case. So it's not like me where I've got a body and a soul, and they can go off and do to totally different things. This is all one piece, okay? But for God, they are three in person, so they can each have three different roles, and yet they are one God. 
So we're going to get more into that. You'll notice here in this first part, he doesn't talk about the Spirit. He just talks about the eternal Logos and God the Father. He doesn't have occasion to talk about the Spirit yet, but the Spirit's going to come up. So we'll get to it when we get to it. So he says the Word was with God, and then to make sure that we don't mistake what he's talking about, he also says the Word was God. Now, after this, in verse 2, he repeats it. Now, anytime we see Scripture repeat something, it's sort of like God's turning up the volume a little bit. He's turning up the dial, saying, please pay attention to this. This is an important doctrinal concept. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then just to make sure you don't mistake that, he says, he, meaning Christ, was in the beginning with God. So he said it in three ways in the first sentence. I'm going to put it all together in one in the second sentence to make sure we don't forget. He's separate from God. He is God. And they were both together in the beginning. Now, that's his relationship. This is the, the, the Logos relationship to the Godhead. That's the first, first two verses here. Now we're going to get into his relationship to creation. So let me do some more erasing. All right. We can do all of this. All right. Now it says, Lauren, can you reread for me verse um, three? All things are made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Very good. It says, All things were made through him. You'll see some translations, some English translations that say by him. That's fine too. Um, but through him is more accurate if you look back at the original Greek. And it, and it captures a point here that the world was created by God the Father through Christ. He's, he's the instrument by which the world was created. So we talked about him being described here as the word, the logos. And then God spoke the world into existence and in Genesis chapter 1, he spoke and there was light. He spoke and, and the, the waters came together and land was formed. He, he spoke and separated earth from the heavens. And he spoke and there were animals and he spoke and there were birds and, and fish and plants. And the, the one thing that he didn't speak into existence was on the last day of creation, the sixth day, when he took the dust of the earth and formed it up together to make man and breathed life into him. We're going to get into that in just a minute. But all of this is God the Father creating the world through Christ, speaking through him, that he's the instrument of creation. And I want us to see, this is not a concept that is just in John. Remember, um, the most prolific writer of the New Testament was Paul. One of his letters was to um, the church in Colossae. It's called the Book of Colossians. And if y'all will turn to me to the Book of Colossians, Bumsy, if you, if you need to open multiple tabs, do it, man. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you're there. Two thumbs up. Perfect. All right. So read along with me. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. I'm going to start reading in verse 15 through 17. He, meaning Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Paul does a great job here of, of reiterating and capturing this concept of God creating the earth through him. Now, one thing that Paul, one word that Paul uses here is firstborn. And I want to make a point here that back in John, it says all things were made by him and nothing that was made. I don't want to paraphrase. He says 
without him was not anything made that was made. So all things that are created were made through Christ, which means that Christ preexisted all created things, which means that he is the uncreated creator. Why do I say that? There are many religions in the world that believe that A, Jesus was a real person. B, that he was a good person. C, maybe he was a good teacher. And some even believe that he was a martyr for the faith. Some even believe he was kind of a deity. But many of them fall short when they think of him as a created being. In other words, sort of like a demigod, that he was the first thing created, and then it was after that, through him, that the rest of things were created. But John doesn't leave any room for that in verse 3. He says, all things that were made were made by him, and nothing that was made was made outside of him, which means he could not have been made. He already existed. He's the uncreated creator. Then we get to John, and it says he's the firstborn of all creation. And we might go, wait a minute, that kind of sounds like he's the first thing that was created. But then Paul goes, no, 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 for by him all things were created. And so just so we don't mix it up, he says, don't forget, he's the uncreated creator. Now, Paul makes another point here in verse 17 that we don't get in John chapter 3 that I think is also important. And that is, the last part of verse 17. Fumsi, can you read for me starting after the comma in verse 17? Or you can read all of verse 17, either way. In Colossians chapter 1. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Very good. And all things hold together in Christ. This means that not only did he create all things, all things continue to exist simply because he wants them to. He is the power that upholds all things that are created. He is the power that is keeping your molecules from ceasing to exist, not just flying apart and becoming randomness. No, no, from ceasing to exist. So if we look back at... Um, Back at John chapter 3. John chapter 1, excuse me, in verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, this word made, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and it uses the word made, which is good. Um, there's also another version called the New American Standard Bible, the NASB, and it uses the word came into being. So it says, basically, all things came into being through him, and without him, nothing came into being that came into being. And when the, I, I've got an NASB that I study, and um, it's a nice big study Bible. It's over there on the nightstand. And I like it, but I read that phrase, and I went, man, came into being is really passive. I mean, when I think about made, I think, man, you know, I made it. Or like, I made some software. Or, you know, I went out there and, and made something for the kids in the backyard for them to play with. Um, that it's an action thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a transitive verb. I made it. But if we start to think about, I'm going to erase a little bit here. If we start to think about um, our timeline again. Let me get the timeline back out. And it looked like this. And, and here's our big C, and there's eternity, future, and, and, and after creation, all these things exist, and the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and the galaxies, and the whole universe. And before this point of creation, what existed again? Is it? Uh, Christ. Well, we've got, we've got God the Father, and Christ, and there's nothing. There's just nothing. There's nothing else. It's just them. Now, that means that all things that were created were created out of nothing. In Latin, we call this ex nihilo, which literally means out of nothing. 
So that means that there was nothing in being, nothing existed, and then they came into being, which makes this phrase actually sound pretty accurate. So it's not like I go to the beach and I get a bucket and I, and I take some sand and I shove the sand in there and then I set it down and look, I've got a sandcastle. I made a sandcastle. No, no, no. The sand on the shore was made out of nothing. God didn't take a bunch of pre-existent matter and push it together into a ball and carve little rivers and streams and put little people on it and then send it spinning into the universe and go, look, I made the earth. Okay, what's next? No, no, no. He spoke it and by divine power called something that is matter into existence out of nothing. Absolutely nothing. That's the divine power that the uncreated creator has in creation. Now, the second part of verse three, without him was not anything made that was made. That means that it doesn't matter how far you go down in the ocean, how high you go up on a mountain, how far you go out to the farthest reaches of the galaxy and other universes, you will not find one single particle that was not made by Christ, that was not called into being by his own divine power, which means that there is not one single molecule that's outside of his control. He owns all of it. It was made through him and it was made for him, which gives me a lot of comfort when I think about that, that, that there's nothing in my life that he can't fix. There is nothing in my life that he's unaware of. When my son was born with two massive holes in his heart and was on the brink of death when he was five months old, I couldn't do anything about that, but God could. God ordained that modern medicine would develop in the way that it has so that my son could be saved and wasted. I, there's no way I could pull that off, but God can pull that off. When I think about before my son was born, we had two miscarriages, which means I really have four children and I've only ever met two of them. And we weren't sure in that time period whether we would be able to have children. And I've never seen my wife cry that hard. But God was not unaware of that circumstance. He was in control of that circumstance because he made our bodies and he upholds all of the universe by the power of his own will. That's comforting to me. And I want that to be comforting to you too, to know that there's not, God is not a God who spun the world and threw it out there in the universe and said, I'm just going to see what happens. No, no, no. He's not just a transcendent God. He's not up here above all things just watching to see what goes on. He's an imminent God. He's right here next to us. He's here in our lives working in creation according to the purpose of his will, to carry out redemption for his glory and for our salvation. So let's continue. In verse 4, Lauren, can you reread for me verses 4 and 5 of John chapter 1? Sure. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Good. It says, in him was life. I need to erase a little bit so I can rewrite that here. In him was life. Now, there's no other word here. Not in my translation and not in any translation. Because in the Greek, there's no article. It doesn't say the life. It doesn't say a, a life. It just says in him was life. Now, I've got a cup of water here. And if I told you in this cup was water, you wouldn't think all the water in the world is in this cup. Because the way I phrased it sounds like in this cup was some water. I could put some there and it would mean exactly the same thing. If I said in this cup was the water, you would at least think that there was all of some specific kind, but it's all of it. It was right, it's right here. This is the water. That's in English. If I put an article here, that's what that means. In Greek, if I put no article there, like it's written here, this means all life. In him was all life. He is the source of all life. And this word life is not the Greek word bios which is where we get the word biology. Bios is natural life. 
Instead, it's, I, I can't do these Greek letters justice. This is the, um, in English, it kind of looks like zoe. This is all kinds of life. Any life that exists, not just natural life, there's natural life, spiritual life, there's, there's even just the power of life to exist is captured in this word zoe. And all of that life finds its source in Christ. So in looking at the created world, he's the source of life, but specifically in reference to mankind, it says, and the life was the light of man. And so we see here at the beginning of John talking about the concept of light versus darkness. And anytime he uses the word light, he's talking about inner divine truth. In man, uh, this, this comes through in us as a, as a natural understanding of right and wrong, that we're born with this concept of right and wrong, but we choose to do wrong. Sometimes we'll call this our conscience. This isn't a separate person. Sometimes we, we personify conscience, like it's a little angel on one side and a devil on the other, and they're, they're telling us, oh, go do this, oh, go do that. No, conscience is this inner understanding. It's, a, it's like this inner stamping of the image of God on us that says, no, 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 I'm a holy God. I made you to be holy. And you've got this already understanding of what right and wrong are. Whether or not we go about doing right and wrong is something that's up to us. And we're going to cover that in depth in, in future chapters. Darkness is always referred to as what's the opposite of truth. This isn't a trick question. It's falsehood. And falsehood ultimately comes in its biggest expression as sin. Now, sin is anything that displeases God. Now, that's a very generic understanding. But if God is holy and we are not, anything that we do that is a rejection of his law on us, that's a rejection of what he expects of us, is sin. So we've got, you know, we're, 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 we're ordered people. We like lists. And so God gave us some lists in the Bible, some things to sort of help us understand what sin looks like. We see some of those lists in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we've got a very de detailed description of God's law, law given through Moses. And some of those are in the Ten Commandments. But we also see some lists like that in the New Testament. And they're always compared with, here's a list of what sin looks like, compared next to, here's a list of what righteousness looks like. And so we always see, don't just turn away from the, the things that we're not supposed to be doing. Here's the things that we're supposed to be doing. Here's the things that God's going to enable us to do when he fills us with his Holy Spirit. And so here it says that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And this is where we're going to finish up, because I want us to get a picture of the darkness that's in the world, the sin that that covers everything since the fall. Since Adam and Eve sinned, man was cursed as a natural result of that sin. And, and as a result, sin pervades everything that we do. Even the good things that we want to do are usually done out of selfish motives. We don't do them in order to please God. We don't do them because we want to please God. We do them because, um, you know, let's say I go help somebody, and if I do that in my own sinful nature, I'm doing it because I want the, the, inner, the, the inner good feeling. It's, it's, it's just for me to feel good. It's not to go, no, this is the right thing to do. And I do it because of what God's done for me. And so that darkness may pervade the entire world since the fall. And yet the light of Christ has not been overcome by that darkness. It's sort of like there's a room down here that is filled with darkness. There's no windows. There's no doors. And then you light a single match in that room. And the light, the light shines in that darkness and fills the whole room. And suddenly you can see, even though it's a tiny little match. And I want you to notice, all the way through verses 1 through 5, we see in the beginning was, past tense, the word. Verse 2, he was in the beginning. Verse 3, all things were made through him, past tense. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, past tense. But then in verse 5, the tense changes. The light shines, present tense, in the darkness. It has not stopped shining. God continues to shine. 
the light of Christ in the darkness, working in men's hearts and turning them back to him. This is a persistent thing. It's not going to stop until he returns. And we can take comfort in that, that he is continuing to work in creation for his own purpose, to change who we are so that we can know him. And that's where we'll wrap up today. Look at that. I actually finished on time. What do y'all think? Questions? Thoughts? That was great. I liked it. Yeah, very in depth. And it's sometimes I feel like reading the Bible, it's so repetitive at times that you're like, I don't know where like this context first stemmed from. So it's nice jumping from book to book just to understand mm -hmm. the meaning of, of one passage. Yeah. 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 There's 66 books in the Bible. There were like 40 different authors, I think, all of them inspired by the spirit. And we see that evidence of that in the consistency of the message. So as, as we read, we're always going to want to turn back to look at other references in scripture because scripture does a very good job of explaining other pieces of scripture. Um, now we see in the old Testament, this is totally an aside, we see what's called progressive revelation. So like the understanding of who God is builds throughout the Bible. Um, if you're in Genesis, you're, it's going to be, you, you see hints of who Christ is and hints of who the Holy Spirit is. Um, and we see that expressed more and more as we go through the Old Testament. And then it's made visible and apparent and obvious in the New Testament. But it's not, it's not a replacement of what's in the old. It's pointing back to the old and going, look, this is where this part was told about me. And even Jesus, um, after he was raised from the dead and um, would appear to different disciples, there were two that he appeared to in the Gospel of Luke on the, the road to um, Damascus. And they didn't recognize him when he appeared. They just thought he was some other guy. And he walked with them, and they were very sad. And he said, why are you so sad? And they said, don't you know about the things that have been going on? There was this guy that we used to follow named Jesus, and people didn't like him. And so they, they crucified him, and how, now he's died. And, and now we're sad. And this was, these were two people that followed him all the time. And he said, don't you know who that guy is? He says, and then Jesus went back to the Old Testament. And as they walked along the road to Damascus, he explained to them all things about himself from the New Testament. All the law and the prophets and the writings pointed to him. And when they got to where they were going, he disappeared and they realized who it was. And they said, as we listened to him talk about it, our, our hearts burned within us. And so even Jesus said, if you want to know about me, you can go back to the Old Testament and read all about me. And so it's all one piece. It's all consistent. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, one part I was like, I, um, so when you're talking about um, God, Christ, and Spirit being um, basically they're not separate, but it's the same entity. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, like the the let's say the Hindu mythology word for it is an avatar, right? So mm -hmm. you have one God, but you have like different avatars of it and they come in different parts of, you know, timelines and all that. But you're basically referring to the same person, you know, or same entity if you think about it. Gotcha. So yeah, <laughs> something gotcha. that kind of popped into my head. Then. Yeah, there's a lot of ways that we try to picture what that is. Uh, one of those might be, you know, like different forms of water. You know, you've got water that can be ice, it can be liquid, it can be a gas. And so you've sort of got different shapes. That captures it a little bit, but it doesn't capture the personhood because water is still just water. It doesn't matter what form it's in. But each of the different persons have different roles in redemption. We always see God, the Father, purposing and sending. We see God, the Son, accomplishing in history um, salvation. And we see God, the Holy Spirit, applying salvation, regenerating our hearts, and uh, renewing our minds. And so each of the three have a role in redemptive purposes, bringing a redeemed people to himself. Um, and yet they are one. And that, so this is sort of like we can see them working separately, but we also see them working as just one. So 
Yeah, that's a hard concept. And that's, I'm not going to claim to know um, how to describe that very accurately. And, and some of the greatest theologians in history would say, you know, every time I think about the Trinity, I think about the three. And every time I think about the three, I'm reminded of the one. And so I can't, I can't, I can't stick to one of those. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of, I don't want to use the word mystery because that sounds very mystical, but um, there are things about God that we cannot understand because our minds are finite and he as a being is infinite. But what's been revealed in this book with words that we can't understand is a portion of an, an image of who he is that we can grasp. And, and so the hidden things are for him, but the revealed things are for us to understand. So we're just going to keep, we're just going to keep diving in. Next time I brought up John the Baptist just barely. Next time we're going to talk more about him and we're going to get into this. Um, man, we're going to get into some really good stuff. I'm excited. Um, we're going to see some more about light. We're going to see more about being born again. Good stuff. All right. Well, any more questions? No. Nope. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you for doing this. Thank you both for coming. Um, it's been a blessing to me to spend this time with you. And, and I pray that we continue to be able to do this. Is this the best time for you two? Um, honestly, things can go haywire at any yeah. moment. Yeah. So it's a little difficult, but, uh, but having two times is so nice, just in yeah. case. Um, okay. If I can't do the Friday to be able to come on Monday, but if that doesn't work for you um, and there's only one time, then, then I can try to make that work. I'm going to keep trying to do two times. Okay. I'm also going to keep recording and hopefully the recordings will turn out better than the last one. And, um, and then I'll just pick one of the two recordings and make that like, if you want to watch it later, then this will be the one. I should be able to make it for the Friday one as well. Friday night, I can stay a little late and stuff like that. But last Friday, I was just too sleepy. Yeah. I could not. Not a it. problem. Not a problem. There were several who said they couldn't make it Friday. So I definitely wanted to have Monday. Um, I, it's not yeah. a big deal. It's not a big at deal least, to me. At least in the beginning, I think uh, having both options will be nice okay. by the time you figure out which is like the most, uh, you know, convenient yeah. one. So I'm also teaching this class on Wednesday nights um, to the men's class at church. Um, it's not like just for men. We're just walking through the Gospel of John, just like we're doing here. So I'm studying once, and then I'm teaching it three times, which is fine for me because the study part is like the heavy lifting during the week, and then when we when we teach, we just we can just get together and talk. So yeah, so I don't mind. Cool. Thank you both for coming. Now get back to work. <laughs> Have a good rest Bye. of your day. Have a good rest of your night too. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.